recording in progress. Praise God. All right. So I'm excited about this week. We've been talking about studying the book of Revelation, right? Just diving in, going verse by verse and studying this book. Now, when we started talking about this, this was before um, Hamas decided this week to bomb Israel. And for the first time since 1973, Israel has uh, declared war. So we've been talking about studying the book of Revelation before these events started um, unfolding before our eyes. What an exciting time to be alive. What an exciting time to see these things happening, to know and to understand we're in these last days, right? So as we're studying the book of Revelation, um, first and foremost, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, you shouldn't be scared to study the book of Revelation, right? And why not? Because the book of Revelation, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. We're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. That's what this book is. And it, it shows us, it gives us a glimpse of what's going to happen in the last days that we know we're living in. It also gives a reassurance over and over again that we're going to be gone. The church is going to be gone. The blood bought is going to be out of here. We're going to talk about that as we get over to Revelation 4.1. It's a beautiful, beautiful verse. I love it in the word of God because from, from Revelation 1 to the end of Revelation 3, we're dealing with the church. We're dealing with us, the blood bought, okay? After the seven letters to the seven churches, don't get confused by that. There were a lot of churches in that time. We're going to talk about that a little bit more tonight. But the word that the the letter, the number seven in, in Greek and biblical um, terminology, it means complete. It means full grown. It means to to the to the completeness, to the fullness. It doesn't need any more growth. So when you see um, the book of Revelation is a lot of sevens. It's talking about the completeness. It's being full grown. It's being matured. There's nothing else that has to be added to it. So a lot of this, when we look through it, there is symbolism. There is things that we're going to have to look at other places in the word of God to understand that it is a wonderful study through the book of Revelation. I do not want you to be afraid of it. If you're afraid of the rapture taking place, then we can fix that. You can give your life to Jesus. You can surrender your heart to him and make him your Lord and your Savior so that we will be looking forward to his return. At a moment in the twinkling of an eye, um, we studied this the last time. I'm going to briefly go over this again. The, the book of Revelation, we're going to talk more about it in 4.1, but I firmly believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe the word of God validates that and teaches that plainly for all who want to know it, to, to believe in it. He says, we are not the children of wrath. <laughs> he tells us that we're not the children of the darkness, but we're of the light. He lets us know that we might not know the, the day or the hour, but we will know the season of his return. He makes it clear to us as sons and daughters that we don't have to be fearful of this time. We can get excited knowing, knowing that at any moment, at any moment, God may look at Jesus and say, go get your bride. It's time. So as we're looking through here, we're going to start in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. I'm seeing if anybody else has any questions. I don't think so. But um, it shows you right there. Look above. I'm trying to help, help my sister, sister. All right. The revelation of Jesus Christ. We talked about that. That is what this word is. If you've got your Bible, you can go through it with me. Which God gave to him. So where did this revelation come from? It came from God. Okay. Came from God. God gave the revelation to Jesus. 
to show his servants things. Who's he showing? His servants. Now, in my Bible, there's an asterisk by that word servants. It means it takes you to another scripture and it gives you the root word for that and it explains what that means. You can also go to the Blue Letter Bible. That's the app that I use. You can go on the Blue Letter Bible. You can click on the scripture. You can do the interlinear coordinates and hit that. And then you can hit any word and it tells you the Hebrew or the Greek. Okay. Hebrews, Old Testament, Greek is New Testament. It'll tell you the root word and what it means. Our English translation sometimes is different than what the Greek word or the Hebrew word is. And so that's one of the reasons you have to know and study what it actually means. So, when you look up that word servant, it literally means, this is so cool to me, this is so cool to me. When you look up the word servant, it means one in bondage to, what? One in bondage or subject to another, usually translated slave or servant. You will hear Paul in the New Testament talk about being a bond servant. What he's saying is, I am enslaving myself to Christ Jesus. Voluntarily, mm -hmm, service in which a person willingly offers obedience, devotion, and loyalty to another. That's why we teach all the time that this word of God is a love letter to his children. When you're a servant, when you're a bond servant, when you have willingly, willingly given your life to him to serve him, this is who the letter is to. God gave it to Jesus. Jesus has the ability, the right, the command, the, the instructions from God to release this word to his servants, to the ones who have willingly made the choice to become a bond servant to Jesus Christ. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Had somebody um, recently getting set free from strongholds in their life. Well, listen, listen. At the name of Jesus, every demon has to flee, but there are the blood. If the blood is not applied, if that person's not saved, they're not set free. If they're not redeemed, if they're not, not surrendered totally to God, to Jesus, if the blood doesn't cover them, then you're causing more harm than good, right? Hey, are you saved? If you died today, are you ready to meet Jesus right now? Are you ready if the rapture took place right now? Right now, are you ready? Because everything that we're going to study out through the book of Revelation, everything that was prophesied to take place before the rapture has taken place. Every single thing has happened. If you're not ready, get ready. Get ready. Because it could take place at any minute. Once you are set free, once you are blood fault, then hey, guess what? The blood of Jesus sets free. He redeems. He delivers, right? But, but being delivered without discipleship is a dangerous place. Here we see that God gave it to Jesus. Jesus gives it to his servants. Oh, that's us. That's us. He is going to send an angel to John to give John all of this information. And John writes it out for us to have. This is this is biblical foundation one on one. You gotta know that that in Galatians, if I could turn here while I'm trying to talk at the same time, when you look at this is my next study, maybe, but when you look at the word of God and how the church was set up and how Acts 242 has become one of my favorite scriptures. Prior to Constantine, who was Constantine? He was a Roman leader, emperor, whatever. 
whatever. When he saw the church beginning to act like the church and everything unfolding in the church world and all of these things happening, he was like, what, what, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I allow the church to do all of this, then they will take over, right? And me as the emperor, me as the king, I will lose, I will lose rulership is what he thought. That's where Catholicism set up. We're a man, we're a pope, where there's a human leader other than Jesus. And you know what they did? This blows me away. I know I'm, I know I'm squirreling, but this is this blows me away. I, I didn't know this till last week. So when Constantine came in and he took over like 600 or 900 temples of these Greek mythology false gods, do you know what he did? He didn't destroy them. He didn't destroy them. It was like every statue of Zeus, he turned into Peter. He said, that's going to be Peter now. Every statue of, a, of, of Her Hercules or whoever, he just changed the name and said, this is going to be Luke. He didn't destroy any of the false gods, idol worship statues. He just changed. That's why you see Catholicism praying to dead saints and, and thinking that these people have anything that they can get from them. It's, it's crazy when you research what happened. But prior to Constantine, when you read the book of Acts, when you read the New Testament and you see what Jesus died to put in place, the true church. The true church, right? He tells us here, if I can get to it somewhere, I think it's in Galatians chapter two, I'm trying to get here. He lets us know, he says, if anybody, I don't care if it's an angel, if anybody comes and preaches to you a gospel, who you know it's God when he leads you to it. Galatians 1, 9. And we said before, so now I say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that you have received, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. That means that word accursed is a serious word. It means something that, that I'm looking at right now to read to you because I won't want to miss it. I could just read to it. Anyway, it means to be accursed. It means to be put down. It's one of the worst things that could possibly happen to you. And I'm reading it right now. So you'll see that word accursed in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. This is what we're doing every week. We're going scripture by scripture through the, through the Bible, through um, Revelation. It's the same word. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God causes Jesus a curse. That word a curse means devoted to destruction. Its association with sin had an evil connotation, synonymous with a curse. Okay, this is huge. He's telling them in the New Testament, if anybody speaks under you a gospel other than what we teach, the apostles Okay, the ones who were witnesses, we're going to learn about that in just a minute. Let them be a curse. Let them have a curse on them. Okay, it's a big deal. So he's going on and he's telling them, but my servants, you're going to receive this information. That's why don't be listening to some people that tell you that you need a book by some apple that hit some guy on the head and he had a vision and elevating himself to the same level of God. No, 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 no. This word this word is what God left for us to have. He says, I'm going to show you things which must shortly come to pass. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that it's going to happen within the next day or two. It means that it will quickly transpire. It means that once it starts unfolding, it's going to quickly come to pass. Okay, That's what it literally means. He sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John, okay? Who bear witness, that means to, to, to bore witness, it means to bore witness, all right? It means to bear witness. It means, right here, I wrote it down, it's a witness, it's a historical attestation, evidence, judicial or general certification, okay? 
of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. That testimony, this is all legal terms. When you study the word of God in the New Testament, they use legal terminology. A witness is, an, they have knowledge of it. They heard it. They saw it. They experienced it themselves, okay? It's a testimony of what has been seen, heard, or known. The root word meaning is someone who's ready to die for what they know to be true. This is who Jesus leaves this word for. That's us. That's us, okay? And this is when it gets cool. Blessed, okay? Yep. Blessed means fortunate, well-off, happy, is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. From the moment Jesus ascended back into heaven, from the very second that the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit was released to us, from the moment of Pentecost, the time is at hand. 2,000 years. You can do it prophetically. You can look at the timetable. You can figure it out. It's all right there for us to understand. If if he doesn't send Jesus back today, we're one day closer to his return. Amen. The biblical timeline is very easy to decipher. We don't know when the rapture is going to take place. Okay. We don't know that. That's the one unknown. Only God knows when he's going to look at Jesus and say, go get your bread. But from the time that the peace treaty is signed in the Middle East, okay? From the time that the peace treaty is signed in the Middle East, from that moment forward, you got three and a half years and then three and a half years, and we coming back with Jesus all riding on horses. Come on, somebody say yeehaw. That's what's going to happen, okay? We're going to study this out. From the moment the rapture takes place until the signing of the peace treaty, we don't know. That might be a day. That might be a year. We don't know. But we do know from the moment of the signing of the peace treaty, seven years out, is when Jesus comes back. So some things we do know. Some things we don't. There again, the seasons we are commanded to be aware of. Good. So he says here. John to the seven churches. Now, why is he only writing to seven churches? I know I had the same question. Why is he on? Because there were several churches. Corinth was right next to Ephesus. Like, why is he only writing to seven churches? I believe in several of the things that are spoken about here, but I do believe that not only is it speaking to the fact of dispensations, like there are different dispensations, different periods of time where these seven churches are in relationship to, to a period of time. We're in Laodicea pretty much as the last days. But I also believe that in a spiritual walk, in a life of a blood-bought Christian, you will have the temptation, the trap, the ability to find yourself at any given one of the seven churches in your life, okay? That's why it's so important for us to study these churches out and see what Jesus is speaking to these churches. Remember, remember the word seven, when they use the number seven, it means full grown. It means complete. It means whole. So when he's speaking to seven churches, that is complete, full-grown, whole church age. That means if you look at this church or that church or this person in this church or this person in that church, they're fitting in one of these seven churches, okay? It is a picture, a complete picture of the wholeness of, of the church age that we are living in now. I'm going to recap that quickly. Why do we say church age? Where does that come from? Okay, I'm glad you asked. All through the Old Testament, all up into the time of the cross, 
God dealt with his chosen people, Israel. Okay? That's who he dealt with. From the moment of Christ's resurrection, it became all about the church, the age of grace, the church age. That is where we are today. Okay? Starting in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it goes back to dealing with Israel, and you do not see the church anymore after that moment. So the church age, also called the age of grace, is from the cross to the rapture. That's where the church age is. If you don't understand what the church age is, that's where Gentiles, me and you, unless you're a Jew, Gentiles are grafted in, we're adopted into the fold. Thank God for the Jewish people who rejected Jesus because had they not rejected Jesus, we would have never been adopted into the, into the kingdom, into the family. So right now, during the age of grace, we're dealing with the church, okay? Does anybody have any questions about that before we go any further? Everybody good? Everybody's good. All right. If you have any question at any time, come off of the mic and ask, because this is really cool stuff, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, and I want to teach and grow and learn as we do this together. So, he says, John to the seven churches, okay? Now, he's telling us, he's giving this information to John. He's talking to the seven churches. He's saying unto them, grace be unto you and peace. Grace and peace, okay? Grace and peace. These are the two things that Jesus is speaking over the church, especially in these last days. Grace and mm -hmm. peace. That's why I teach it all the time until grace touches it. Until grace touches That's it. That's her question. Go ahead. I turned it off. What? I turned this light off in the bathroom for you, uh, Sadie May. And I'm going to go back and bathe. Okay. All right. I muted her. She's going to get a bath. We love you, Sister Phyllis. Okay. So when he talks here, grace and peace. Okay, grace and peace from him which is and which was and is to come. This is so important. This is so important. He said grace and peace. When grace touches something in your life, it means grace has been imparted into your life to do the thing that grace touched you to do. You got to know that. He never, God never asked you to do anything that he's not given you the grace to do. His grace is sufficient. Oh, I can't do that. Oh, you better believe you can. Why? Because grace and peace has been given to you by Jesus Christ himself. If he asks you to do it, he's given you the grace to get through it. It is from the one who was and is and is to come. What does that mean? It means that Jesus, it means that God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, they forever were, they forever will be, and they forever are right now. He was in your yesterday, he's already in your tomorrow, and he's right where you are now. We look, we look at time like I got to look forward, or I got to look back, or I got to look now. God is looking over like, like almost looking over and he always was and he always is. Your infinite mind cannot comprehend, cannot comprehend. Or is it your finite mind? Your finite mind cannot comprehend the infinite mind of God. He always was. He always will be. And he still is right now. That's why when the word of God says, then he directs my steps. He ordained my steps. Why? He's already gone before me. He's already been there. He's already been there. And from Jesus Christ, he says, and from the seven spirits, that means complete, whole, full grown, that's the Holy Spirit, which are before his throne, from Jesus Christ, who's the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, 
and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He's made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. What's he saying there? He's saying everything you need to know right there. If the word of God was only those scriptures, you'd have enough to shout and glorify God and praise God until the rapture today's place. He's letting you know. He says, Jesus is the faithful witness. He was the first fruit. He was saying, just like he was resurrected from the grave, you will be too. He walked out of the grave. I'm walking too. Come on. I don't even know how to sing. But that song, whatever he did, we are able to do. Why? Because of his blood. He washed us. He cleansed us. He gave us the keys to death, hell, and the grave. It is by his blood. It is by his testimony. It is by him being the faithful witness. Why was he the faithful witness? How many minutes I got? I got about five minutes left. Good. Praise God. He was the faithful witness. What does that mean, Stacy? Mm, I'm glad you asked. So, where you see here where it says the faithful witness. Come on. Come on. He served his dad. He was obedient to God the Father in every single thing he did. He said, I ain't going nowhere until God tells me. I ain't speaking nothing unless God tells me. Nothing I do, nothing I say is done unless God the Father tells me to do it. And he still in his humanity, every time you turned around, you see Jesus escaping, separating himself to do what? To pray, to commune with the Father. If Jesus needed a prayer life, how much more do we? If Jesus himself, as a faithful witness, had to separate himself, get away from everybody, get along with the Father. How much more do we? Because he was faithful. He was the faithful witness, what he saw, what he heard, what he experienced, what he did. See, he's already been there. Come on, somebody. He's already been there. He's already been there. He's already in eternity. He's way back in Genesis. And he's right now. He's the faithful witness. He's already been there. So cool to think about. The first begotten of the dead. You know why there's a first fruit? Because there's more to come. If there's a first fruit, there's a harvest. So beautiful. So important for you to understand and know. And to the prince of the kings of the earth. Come on, somebody. Firstborn, the rulers of the earth. And Tim that loved us. Washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's real love. He washed us from our sins by his own blood. Mm. Made us kings and priests unto God and his father. Do you get your identity in Christ Jesus? You're a king and a priest. What? Yeah. King and priest. You're going to learn as we get to the end of this. That we are going to be kings and priests. We already are. But after after Armageddon in the millennial reign, you're going to be a ruler. Yeah. Yeah. It's important to know that. That your identity, your royalty, when you're blood bought, it's time we act like it. It's time we walk like it and we talk like it, right? 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 We're blood bought, kings and priests. Unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So when he says this, he says, the sacrifice of Jesus has given to all believers privileges that had belonged to ancient Israel. He's made us kings and priests. It's clearly a present tense reference to the believer's function now. Now. It's what he's made us to be. It is so important to understand. Now, in the opening in Revelation, John introduces himself as a brother, a companion in the struggle we all face. We're going to get to that in a minute, okay? And when he says this here in verse 7, behold, he comes with clouds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I got two minutes. 
and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Mourn, the tribes of the earth will mourn, even so, amen. Now, the second time he comes back, so he's going to come back in the rapture, going to come meet us in the clouds, only the blood bowl are going to be up there, okay? But the second coming, second coming, when he comes back to fight, the battle of Armageddon, he just speaks, he don't have to fight. Everybody's going to see him then. Israel will know that he is the Messiah. That is what he's talking about right here. Can't get the two confused, okay? Next week, we're going to start, we're going to finish this, and then we're going to get into the churches, the study of the churches, which is so super cool. I have less than one minute. Does anybody have any questions about what we've gone over tonight? Please send the question now or message me privately later. This is Lindsay. She don't know that I'm on still with praise and purpose. So any questions? Anybody got one? It did record. Lindsay, I'm on praise and purpose. Do you have a question? Okay, well, I got less than a minute. Wait a minute. So I love you too. That is so funny. All right, so I'm going to try to figure out how to upload this. Kylie, if you're on here, somebody that might know how to do this. This is the computer in my office at church. When you come to church, you're welcome to come in here and get this computer and try to upload it if I 